Konnichiwa, I'm John Hornick. Welcome to my Japanese Fave series where we'll cover every major type of Japanese food. I've read books about the sake making process, studied the process as part of obtaining my sake certifications, and even brewed sake at home twice. Recently, I was also able to observe sake being made on a large scale in real time. This video chronicles my visit to a fairly large brewery in Japan. I'm not naming the brewery because this video is about the process, not about the brewery's products. So let's start learning. The first step in making sake, especially premium sake, is to mill the rice. You see here a photo of uh, some big milling machines. Some breweries, in fact many breweries, do their own milling uh, and some uh, contract the milling out. And why do we mill the rice? Well, for premium sake, uh, Hanjozo, for example, the outside of the rice grain is milled away so that you have 70% or less remaining. That's for a Hanjozo. For a, uh, a Ginjo or a Junmai Ginjo, you mill away 40% of the outside of the rice grain, so you have 60% or less remaining. And for a Daiginjo or a Junmai Daiginjo, you mill away at least 50% of the outside of the grain, so you have 50% or less remaining. Some uh, breweries will mill away a lot more. Uh, I've seen numbers down that I've had, the sake that's been milled down to 23% remaining, uh, but I know that there are some that are even lower. So the uh, rice is put into the uh, hoppers at the top of the mills and it comes out the bottom uh, which you can see in this video. And after the rice has been milled, uh, it's basically stored for a couple of weeks uh, in uh, some kind of a hopper that allows the rice to absorb moisture from the air. And uh, again, it's done for about two weeks and this is the resting period after milling. Next, the rice is washed and soaked. Now, there are many ways to do this. Uh, there are highly automated rice washing machines, uh, or it can be done by hand. Now, some brewers believe that uh, washing and soaking is the most important step in the process, and how long you wash is very important to them. How long you soak is very important to them. And as an example of how important this can be, uh, when I interned at the Daimon Brewery, uh, the Kurabito were using a stopwatch to time how long the water was being washed and how long it was being soaked. After the rice has been washed and soaked, the next step is steaming. Now here's a photo of a steamer. As you can see, they're pretty large. They're also in use uh, quite a lot because, as you'll see when we get to the part of this video about making the additions of rice to the sake mash, the rice has to be steamed fresh for each addition. It also needs to be steamed fresh to make koji, and koji takes two days. So you're steaming basically two days before you need the koji. Now I'm gonna show you a short video. It's about four minutes long, uh, but it gives you a good feel for what's involved in the steaming process, how much rice is involved, how heavy it is, uh, how much steam it produces. And toward the end of the video, the rice is moved uh, overhead by a, a winch or a crane system, and it's put into what's, what we call the uh, breaker upper and cooler downer machine. I think the machine has an official name, which I, I may have here in the video, but uh, my teacher of my sake certification course, uh, one of them, John Gauntner, uh, calls this machine the breaker upper cooler downer, which I think is a great name for it. So here's the video. <laughs>
taking uh, sheets of, of fabric and the rice falls onto the sheets of fabric and then they take those sheets and that's 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 how they're able to move uh, relatively small quantities of rice away uh, as it's coming out of the machine. Here's another video the rice coming out of the breaker upper cooler downer. Now after that rice falls out of the breaker upper cooler downer onto the fabric sheets. Those fabric sheets are taken uh, to some place in the uh, brewery, usually a colder or cool room, and they're spread out on mats uh, so that the rice can cool down quickly. Now we're going to talk about making koji. The first step in making sake is to make the shubo or the moto. That's the same thing. It's the fermentation starter or the yeast starter. This must be done first. Making the koji must be done first before you can start the uh, shubo. Okay? You have to have the koji. And it takes two days to make koji, so you start making the koji two days before you're going to start making the fermentation starter or the, the shubo. So making the koji is really day one in the uh, process of making the sake. And the koji is made in what's called a koji room. This is a photo of the koji room through an observation window. And uh, the temperature in the koji room when the koji is being made is about 98 degrees Fahrenheit and it's very high humidity. The way it happens is that the rice is spread out on big tables. You can see the rice spread out on tables here. Uh, it's already been covered with a, a fabric cover. But the way it starts is you, you spread out the rice on the table and then you sprinkle the rice with koji kin. Now koji kin is a mold. It's a friendly mold. It's known as the National Mold of Japan. Its Latin name is Aspergillus orizae. And it's sprinkled on the rice. And after it's sprinkled on the rice, you're making koji rice, and most people just call it koji, not koji rice. After the koji kin, that's the mold, it's been sprinkled on the rice, it's just known as koji. Now after the um, koji kin is sprinkled on the rice, it takes about two days before the koji is ready to be used. And what happens is that the, uh, the mold spores, they propagate on the rice uh, and they uh, multiply and uh, the rice is um, left out like this uh, on the big table overnight and then the next day it's um, broken up and put onto smaller trays and uh, then it's left for about a day until it's ready to be used. Now we're going to talk about making the shubo or the moto, right? As I said, they're the same thing. That's the fermentation starter or the yeast starter. And this is made on day three, or day one and two is making the koji. Day three is making, uh, starting to make the, uh, the shubo, or the moto. And you start in a relatively small tank. You add the koji, uh, steamed rice, and water, and then you also add yeast. Depending on the type of uh, brewing method that you're using, you'll probably also be adding a small amount of lactic acid. After you add these ingredients to the tank, uh, it takes about two weeks or so so that the yeast can propagate, so that the yeast can multiply. The 
Shubo is transferred to a larger tank. This may be the tank that's used for the rest of the process or it might be an intermediate size tank. Because uh, on the first day of the addition, you're adding a, you know, a, a certain amount of rice, koji, and water. On the second edition, you're adding a whole lot more. And on the third day, you're adding a whole lot more than that. So, so some breweries will use um, an intermediate tank. Some breweries will transfer the Shubo to the uh, large tank that they're gonna use for the rest of the process. Now, the koji that's used for these additions began two days earlier. So on each, ad each day that you have an addition, uh, so, so this is a, you're, you're adding rice, koji, and water, three times over a four-day period, each time you add it, the koji for that addition was started two days earlier. Now on day 18, that's the day after the first addition of rice, koji, and water, there is no addition that day. That day is called, called odori. That's the day of the dance. And what that means is that the, uh, the mash is starting to bubble. You can kind of see that in this photo. It's kind of bubbling. And, and some people say it's dancing, right? And what's happening is that the koji is breaking down the rice into sugar and the yeast is breaking down the sugar into alcohol. This is called multiple parallel fermentation. It's unique to sake making. And um, I'll tell you my, my uh, odori story. I have brewed sake twice myself at home. And the very first time that I did it, I had uh, the, uh, the, the moromi in a five gallon bucket with a tight fitting lid. It's the same kind of bucket that you, you buy uh, five gallons of paint in, same kind of bucket. And, but the difference is that that lid has a, uh, a bubbler in it so that pressure can escape and it has a valve in the bottom so that you can drain off uh, the, uh, the sake at, uh, at later on. So, um, you know, I was following the, my recipe and um, I made an addition on the 17th day and then I put the lid on and um, left it for the 18th day. I'm at my office and my wife calls and she said, she was mad, she said, uh, John, you um, didn't put the lid on the sake this morning and there's, there's stuff all over the counter, it's everywhere. And I said, well, I know I put the lid on, I don't, I don't know what could have happened. <laughs> so what happened was that the um, uh, the bubbler, which is supposed to release pressure, couldn't uh, release all the pressure that was building up inside. So the pressure of the odori blew the top off of the container. So I came home and I cleaned it up, and I, but I had never done this before, so I wasn't sure exactly what was happening. And I said, I know I put the lid on there. So I put the lid, cleaned up everything, I put the lid back on tightly, and then two hours later we come back and the same thing had happened again. <laughs> the lid had blown off again. There was mash everywhere. Uh, but luckily, I didn't lose so much of it that um, I uh, had to start all over again. So I put the lid back on this time, and, and I'm also a woodworker, so I got some clamps out of the wood shop, and I clamped the little lid on, and then I put it into, put the whole thing into the shower. So, because I didn't know whether there was so much pressure that it could just cause the whole thing to explode or not, uh, or a rupture, I should say. Uh, so I put the whole thing in the shower in case the sides ruptured, because the clamps were holding the top on. Uh, everything was fine after that. Uh, the container was able to hold the pressure and uh, nothing terrible happened. But uh, that was my introduction to, to Odori. Now after day 18, the Odori day, we have days 19 and 20. And on each one of these days, we're adding more koji, more rice, and more water in increased quantities each day. As I said, on the, on the first day of Sanjan, Sandan Jacomi, we are adding a certain amount of koji rice and water. On day 19, we're adding, not double, but, well, on day 19, uh, we're adding proportionally more. Now, when I say proportionally, it just depends on the brewery and their, um, their particular recipe, how much they're adding. Uh, but you're going to be adding a lot more on day 19 than you added on day 17. And the same thing is true on day 20. Uh, you are adding proportionately more than you added on day 19. And as I said before, the koji for this edition began two days earlier 
And uh, in fact, it began two days earlier for each one of these two editions. So the koji that's being added on day 19 was begun on day 17, and the koji that's being added on day 20 was begun on day 18. Uh, as for the rice, the rice for these editions was also steamed fresh for each edition. Now, after the three editions over four days, then we begin fermentation. And uh, most people will call that uh, 19th day the first day of fermentation. And if this is an Aru 10 sake, that means it's a sake to which a small amount of brewer's alcohol has been added. First of all, why do we add that? We add it for flavor and aroma. It's a small amount. Uh, it doesn't make it more alcoholic. It doesn't affect the final alcohol content because water may be uh, added later to dilute it. Um, but it does affect the um, aroma and the flavor. Now, alcohol is only added to what are called Aru Ten Sakes, uh, Junmai Sakes. Uh, if you see the word Junmai, that means it's, it's, it's made of just koji rice and water uh, and no brewer's alcohol has been added. Uh, if it doesn't say Junmai, it may not say Aro Ten, but if it doesn't say Junmai, it is an Aro Ten. That means that a small amount of brewer's alcohol has been added. Uh, so if brewer's alcohol is going to be added, if it's a type of sake that has brewer's alcohol added to it, that's done now before the fermentation process gets underway. Uh, then after that's done, the sake will, or the, I should say the, uh, the, uh, the maromi, the mash, that will ferment for 20 to 35 days at controlled temperatures, at low temperatures. And again, the temperature that's used, that is up to the brewer. Some will uh, use a really cold temperature. Others will use a cold temperature, but, uh, 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 but there's some that do it really cold. Uh, if this is sake is going to be futsushu, which is basically table sake, not premium sake, uh, the fermentation process will be about 20 days. If the uh, sake is going to be a premium sake, a ginjo or daiginjo, it will be fermented more along the lines of 30 days, possibly uh, longer. After fermentation, the sake is pressed. Now, remember, the sake is being made from rice, and the rice is being broken down into sugar, and the sugar is being broken down into alcohol. Uh, but uh, it's not, uh, the, the rice doesn't disappear completely. Uh, you're left with a, a white sediment, which is called kasu, or sake leaves. And uh, you use a big press. Well, there's different ways of doing the pressing, but uh, a common way is to use a big press. You see it here on the screen. It's almost always called by the name of the company that makes it, and that's Yabuta. So it's called a Yabuta. And uh, this type of pressing is applied pressure, okay? You can see there's kind of a, like accordion-like folds uh, that you can see in the uh, photo. And, uh, and in the uh, other photo, you can see a piston that pushes the press along a track and squeezes the accordion folds. So what happens is that the, uh, the clear socket comes out the other end. As I said, this is applied pressure. Now, there are a couple of other ways of pressing. One is with called a fune. In this photo, uh, this wooden structure here, you can see, this is an old fune press. And the way that fune presses are used is that uh, the sake mash is put into fabric bags. And then the bags are stacked on top of each other. And the weight of the bags causes the sake in the lower bags to be pressed out of the bags, and it comes out of a spout in the fune and they move the bags around so that you, 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 you distribute the weight and eventually press out, um, press the sake out of the, out of the mesh. Uh, and that, so and I call that passive pressure, okay? Because although the pressure is being applied by the bags uh, that are, that are uh, uh, piled up inside of the fune, uh, it's not the same as the ibuta where you have um, you know, a piston that's applying pressure. Here you have the bags just sitting in the fune and they're kind of applying pressure to themselves. Uh, a third type of um, pressing, which I, I don't have a photo of here, is called chizuku. This is a drip process. There's no pressure here. 
The uh, mash is put into fabric bags. They are hung from a, a beam and uh, the sake drips out the bottom, kind of like coffee would come out of a coffee filter. There's no, no pressure being applied to a coffee filter in a drip coffee maker. Instead, the water just drips in on top of the coffee into the filter and drips out the bottom. That's basically the same way as uh, uh, Shizuku pressing happens. And the sake may drip into a tank uh, or it may drip into something called tobin. Tobin are 18 liter jugs. And now the sake that has just come out of the press, what, regardless of which kind of pressing you're using, that is called shiboritate. Shiboritate is just pressed sake. Now after the sake mash has been pressed, there is further clarifying of the sake in most cases. And uh, now at, at this stage of the process, uh, after the pressing, uh, different brewers will do different things in different ways and, and in different words. So the things I'm going to talk about now, they may do them, they may not do them. They may do them in a different order than I'm talking about them, okay? But, but one of the things that they do is called orabiki. Now, orabiki is allowing dregs to settle in the socket. Now, even after the pressing that we talked about on the prior slide, uh, there may still be some... Uh, some sake kazu, some sake lees, some sediment left in that sake. And if you leave it in a container, whatever particulate matter there may be in the sake, that will settle to the bottom. And that is urabiki. And this is done in a post-pressing tank or in a tobi. As I said, not all brewers may do this, or they may do it in a different order. Another step for further clarification, and I'm saying clarification, so you're clarifying the sake, is filtering. Now, um, uh, filtering can be done in a couple of different ways. Uh, the brewery may filter the sake through activated charcoal, or they may filter it through a mesh. And the mesh can be uh, fine, it can be of different levels of fineness. Right? Now, if they don't do this step, if they don't filter the sake, then the sake is called a moroka. Okay, so not all not all brewers are going to do this step. And if they don't do the step, they'll call the sake moroka. That means that it's unfiltered. Some some people will say it means not charcoal filtered, but I think it applies to both uh, any, any type of filtering. If you don't do it, it's a moroka. Now, unfiltered sake is not nigori. Uh, you may see nigori sake on menus in the United States. And some servers may tell you that it's unfiltered sake. Not true. It has been at least pressed. And it's probably been filtered to some extent. The word nigori actually means cloudy. So nigori sake is cloudy sake, not unfiltered sake. Unfiltered sake is moroka. Now another step is pasteurization. And I say another and not necessarily the next step, because I, as I said, different breweries may do these steps in different orders. But pasteurization usually happens to most sake twice. Most sake has been pasteurized twice. It's also possible it's only been pasteurized once. If it's pasteurized once, it's called a nama, N-A-M-A, -A, nama sake. It also may be Maybe that it wasn't pasteurized at all. If it hasn't been pasteurized in, for either one of the two steps, it can be called a namanama or it can be called a namazake. Uh, but sometimes, the, for marketing reasons, the sake will just be called a nama, even though it has, hasn't been pasteurized at all. Now, as I said, there are two times when the sake may be pasteurized. Uh, that's before it goes into storage and before it goes into the bottle. And now some sake breweries are now storing in the bottle, which kind of screws up this whole, you know, this whole system. But if you chose, if, if you're the brewery and you choose not, not to pasteurize the sake before it goes into storage, that's called nama chozo, because the word chozo means uh, storage. 
So if it's namachoso, it means it's not pasteurized going into storage. Okay, now, uh, if you cho choose to pasteurize it before it goes into storage, but you do pasteurize it before it goes into the bottle, that's called namazume. Uh, but again, if, you've, if you're the brewery and you've chosen to uh, store your sake in the bottle, then you could call it namachozo, uh, but you're probably just going to call it nama or namanama or namazake. Now, something I should point out about pasteurization, it can be done in various ways. There are different processes for doing it. Uh, it can be done either in the bottle or out of the bottle. But the important point I want to make here is that the Japanese were doing this long before Pasteur supposedly invented pasteurization. So after the pressing of the sake, the brewery will usually mature the sake for a period of time. Now, they could do this right after pressing, if they don't do orobiki, if they don't do any further filtering. Or they could do it after orobiki, if they do allow the dregs to settle. They probably will do that. Uh, uh, or they could do it right after filtering, uh, whether they do that first pasteurization or not. Now, the maturation can take place either in a tank or it can take place in the bottle. In other words, they bottle it first and they let it mature for a period of time. The, the, um, the time at which sake is matured is usually about six months. Okay, It's usually not more than that. There isn't much in the way of aged sake happening in Japan, like there is aged wine, for example. There are some breweries now that are experiencing or they're experimenting with aging sake, but most sake is uh, stored matured only for about six months. So I'm not calling that aged sake. I'm calling it uh, matured sake. Another step that can happen, usually after maturation, is dilution. Now I mentioned earlier that sometimes brewer's alcohol is added to some types of sake before the fermentation process starts. Uh, that's not always done. But regardless of whether that brewer's alcohol is added or not, the um, brewery may think that the alcohol level is too high after all of these other steps have happened. And if so, they will reduce the alcohol level, the alcohol by volume. They'll reduce that by adding water. It's usually done before the second pasteurization, but it could be done in some other order. This brings down the alcohol. Now, if they don't do this, if they do not add water, to dilute the alcohol content, then the sake is called a genshu. Genshu is undiluted sake. Now let's talk about bottling. Bottling may be the last step, or it may not be the last step. Uh, if the sake has been matured in a tank, and if it's been pasteurized before going into the bottle, then bottling is the last step. But if the brewery is choosing to mature the sake in the bottle, and if they're choosing to pasteurize sake in the bottle, then bottling is not necessarily the last step. You'd be bottling, and then you would, you would have a period of maturation, uh, and you may also have a pasteurization in the bottle. I hope this video has helped you to understand how sake is made. Now, this video was about a process of making sake that was, uh, I'd say, highly automated. Uh, but I have a separate video on handcrafted sake. Sake that, although equipment might be used, uh, there's a lot. It's a lot more of a hands-on uh, process for making it. So take a look for that video as well. So please remember to subscribe to my channel, and thanks for watching.